was praying, asking the Lord which direction to be in, that uh, I seen a connection between all three. And I started thinking to myself that whether you're in one of the minor prophets or the major prophets or in the New Testament, that I'm thankful that the message concerning our Lord and his dealings with mankind is consistent. That uh, he said, for I am the Lord, I change not. And that brings me comfort, knowing that in a world that's constantly changing, that we serve a Lord that changes not. And we have a book, thank God tonight, that is forever settled in heaven. Uh, but I do want to ask you to turn with me to the book of Jonah. And uh, we're going to look at several different passages of scripture tonight. But I have a primary verse that I want to look at here shortly. And I hope that uh, we don't jump around too much, that I hope that you understand the message tonight and it registers in our hearts, but just trying to be faithful to what the Lord's laid upon me for this hour. If you have your Bible, if you'll turn with me to the book of Jonah, and uh, once you find the book of Jonah, I want to look at a few verses in chapter number three, uh, Jonah chapter number three. You have your Bible open to Jonah chapter 3. Still here a few pages. It's kind of hard sometimes to find the book of Jonah. It's kind of nestled down in there like the book of Ruth is. It hides from you. But in chapter number 3, verse 1, the word of God says, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go into Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city, a three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh, they believed, or they, the people of Nineveh believed, or believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout, or through Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything, and let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? Verse number 10, I love this verse. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil uh, that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. We'll stop here tonight and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful tonight, uh, Lord, uh, for your mercy. We're thankful tonight for your grace. We're thankful tonight that you are long-suffering and not willing that any should perish. Lord, I pray that you'd continue to have your hand upon us individually. I pray, Lord, that you'd have mercy upon our nation tonight and ask that you would uh, work in each and every heart and life, uh, Lord, from the highest of ranks down to the lowest. And Lord, I know tonight as we were reminded in this prayer letter that you're concerned about individuals and Lord, you're desiring that every soul be saved. And Lord, I'm thankful tonight for the personal relationship that we have with you. And Lord, help us to realize that you're not some distant deity, but Lord, you're our heavenly father. Lord, you're uh, one that's never going to leave us nor forsake us. And you, uh, Lord, call us friends. And Lord, that we're part of your family. And Lord, you know us better than we know ourselves, and Lord, yet you still love us. And I pray tonight for these next few moments that you'll give us the ability to rightly divide your word. I pray that it would register in our hearts, and Lord, we'd go out of here, Lord, in a greater fellowship and a closer a walk with you. And pray tonight, if there is one here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, may this be the very time that you'll speak to that heart, Lord, and we ask it all in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. I'd say tonight that probably most, if not all in here, is familiar with the book of Jonah and uh, knows the, uh, the context of the verses. And uh, just to give you a little background, and we'll move on real quick, but we know that Jonah was given clear instructions of God, what he desired from him in the very beginning. 
And the Lord didn't uh, mix any words. He said in Jonah chapter number one, verse one, now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah. And here's the message. He said, arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. A clear instructions. God told him what to do and told him when to do it uh, right now and what to do when he got there. And uh, Jonah, he arose okay, but he went in the wrong direction, and he uh, fled down to Tarshish, and he tried to get away from the presence of the Lord, and what a foolish thing that was. He ended up in a, a ship, and ended up down in the ship, and ended up being overboard and swallowed up by a whale that God had prepared. And by the way, if you ever want to do a study in the book of Jonah, notice the times that it speaks about what God prepared. Uh, in Jonah 1.17 says God prepared a fish. In Jonah 4.6 said God prepared a gourd. In 4.7 he prepared a worm. In 4.8 he prepared a wind. Uh, it speaks about the, the things that are great in the book of Jonah. In chapter 1 verse 1 there's a great city. In chapter 1 verse 4 a great wind. Chapter 1 verse 12 a great tempest. Uh, chapter 1 verse 17 a great fish. And then chapter 4 verse number 2 thank God there's a great kindness. Uh, we talk sometimes about the great things in the book of Jonah. But I'll tell you one of the greatest things I see in the book of Jonah is God's love and his mercy and grace uh, towards the undeserving. And you say, who's that preacher? It's every single one. It's Jonah. It was all the bunch down at Nineveh. By the way, Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. And if you don't know much about them, they were a wicked, cruel, barbaric people. Uh, vile and things would happen that was hard to imagine. They would kill and they would take bodies and drag them down the streets and all kind of things. And I think that's partly why Jonah got so upset in chapter number four is after the revival came in chapter number three uh, that Jonah, that he is uh, upset. Uh, a couple of reasons possibly could be for that is because, first of all, that uh, he brought a message uh, as a prophet. He came and he stood up in the city after he had made a day's journey. He said, yet in 40 days, Nineveh shall be overthrown. The only thing is that Nineveh received the message. They believed the message. They responded to the message and God spared them. And so Jonah's prophecy didn't come true. And it was because the people had a change of heart. And I'll tell you this, thank God tonight that in the path of judgment, God has a means of forgiveness and a means of escape. And uh, Jonah also, that he knew these people, and I believe Jonah in his heart felt like that these people deserve the judgment of God. Uh, they deserve to have to pay for their wickedness. They deserve, but really when you get down to it, all of us deserve hell. All of us deserve the judgment of God. But where sin abound, grace, grace doth much more abound. Now going. Uh, back to the book of Jonah, we find that Jonah, he keeps going down, down to Tarshish, down the ship, uh, ends up down in the uh, whale's belly, and in the midst of that whale, he begins to uh, come to his senses as God's dealt with his heart, and, and uh, by the way, God didn't try to get Jonah's attention, God got Jonah's attention, and uh, he prays in the midst of the whale's belly, and, and as he does, uh, he uh, is somewhat asking for forgiveness in chapter number two, you read on through. And then in verse number nine of chapter two, he says, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. And then he said, salvation is of the Lord. And I'll tell you this, salvation is of the Lord. 100% of the Lord, Jesus plus nothing, Jesus minus nothing. But the Lord had the fish to come up. He spake unto the fish, it vomited out Jonah upon dry land. And then chapter number three, we find that the word of the Lord came unto Jonah a second time. Now, this is interesting because I find that God did not change his mind about his man. And he had a, a mission for him. He had a plan for him. And even though Jonah messed it up the first time, that God put him right back up there and gave him an opportunity to right that which is wrong. I tell you this, I'm glad, thank God, that when we mess up, God doesn't throw us out. Uh, that he don't throw the clay away, that over... And over, he molds us and makes us. And uh, we find Peter, uh, that he asked Peter, he said, uh, lovest thou me? And he gave him the opportunity to respond. And then he told him, said, feed my sheep, go back to doing. As a matter of fact, he said, Peter said, Satan hath desired thee, that he may have thee, he may sift thee as wheat. He said, but when thou art converted, he said, strengthen the brethren. Really what the Lord told him was, you're going to fail, and you're going to fail big, but you're going to be restored. And once you're restored, that you've got a work to do. I'm glad, thank God, he doesn't change his mind and change uh, his plan. Uh, God's purpose in using Jonah was to get a message.
message to a group of people that was uh, headed for judgment that they might uh, hear the word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, that they might hear the message, that they might believe the message, they might respond to the message and be spared of the judgment of God. God doesn't take pleasure in bringing about judgment. And I thank God that he's long-suffering. Look at the days of, of Noah and preaching. Look at uh, the right now. I mean, think about this. Why hadn't the Lord already came back? Uh, that P, uh, that uh, Peter, he said in those days, they were scoffers. And the Lord told Peter in chapter number three, he said, write down this verse. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. He gave them 40 days. He said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Now, whenever Jonah goes and preaches this message, verse five said, so the people of Nineveh, believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them. The king uh, sent out a proclamation and he uh, proclaimed and published that there'd be a fast and we find down that they turned uh, from their evil way and turned from their violence. And then in verse number 10, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God withheld the judgment that they were in the path of. Now this is a, a great and wonderful thing that's happened here. Now, I started thinking about uh, uh, this. Here's a, a whole area. I'm talking about Nineveh was a huge area. Three days journey to get across it, the uh, capital city of Assyria. And uh, here's a, a multitude of people that have turned from their wicked ways. Uh, we know tonight the Bible's told us that if we'll uh, pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, it goes and tells us the formula for revival uh, that then he'll heal from heaven and will heal our land. And I say, I believe tonight that God desires to heal uh, our land, but there's going to have to be a turning. There's going to have to be a repentance. There's going to have to be a change takes place. And by the way, uh, repentance means to turn. And it means to turn from sin and to turn to the Lord. Uh, you can turn from sin all day long, but if you don't turn to the Lord in return, uh, it's not going to benefit you. But you've got to turn from this and turn to him. Uh, that faith is forsaking all. I trust God. Him. That's what faith stands for, forsaking all. Uh, I trust him. Now, going back to what's going on here, I started thinking about some of the great awakenings and revivals throughout the years. I remember uh, over the years reading books and studying about some of the past revivals, and, and I'm grateful for the things that I have witnessed and experienced. But I'm going to tell you this, our God is not limited to yesterday. Uh, he's not limited to the past. He's the same God today, yesterday, and forever. And what he did way back then, he desires to do today, uh, just like what he did here uh, at Nineveh. God desires to do in the United States of America and in different counties and cities and the world and all the way around. He wants to see people's hearts uh, turn from their sin and turn to him. But I was reading some of the, uh, the different uh, um, revivals that took place. By the way, that I'm not questioning any of the revivals or things that's happening around America today. I say praise God, uh, bless his holy name. But there's a lot that are analyzing, a lot that are looking, a lot trying to figure out is this really real or is this not real and back and forth. But I'm going to tell you some of the revivals I read about, there wasn't no question as to whether that's real or not. Uh, it didn't wear off uh, whenever the week come around. When the evangelists packed up and went home, it wasn't over. They kept having a change of heart and a change of attitude. Souls continually were being saved and the churches were growing and, and people were getting things right and they were uh, changing the hearts being changed as a work of God. And it was a, a whole different environment. I read about the Welch revival. And by the way, the letter we read tonight from Brother B.J. Stagner, he's in the uh, U.K., and one of the areas that he goes up around is around the area of Wales. And the Welch revival, when it took place uh, uh, back many years ago, uh, said that uh, there was such conviction that the coal miners down in the, uh, the mine shafts were getting under conviction and falling to their knees and crying out to God. Uh, there were schools that were shutting down and churches were being built and, and uh, businesses were closing down so they could uh, go to church and, and so much changed. And it wasn't just a little area over here and over there. It was the, the whole area. Uh, I remember reading that uh, there was a, a man that came into town and he pulled up to a police officer and he asked the police officer, he said, can you tell me uh, where the great revival is taking place and where is it at? He said, oh yeah, he said, it's going on right here in my heart. And he's thanking the Lord for what uh, he had done for him. But I was reading and, and we had here a few years ago, one of our missionaries from over in Wales and he came in and he said, pastor, he said, you wouldn't believe what it's like over there where I'm at. 
He said the churches are huge. He said whenever the revival took place, they were expanding and expanding and building and building and building. And said the pews were filled, and as soon as they'd build, they'd start building again. And he said, now it's so sad. He said, because the people come in and there's a small remnant that's left over. He said, they occupy the first couple of pews and then we try to keep the lights off and the rest of the building to conserve energy. He said, we got all these Sunday school rooms, but most of them are not occupied. He said, we've got all these resources and things available that used to not be adequate because of the number of people and said, now we don't have enough people to even carry on these ministries. And he said, Pastor, he said, the Lord blessed the area where I was in years ago. And he said, the only reason he's still not blessing today is because there was a turn back in the wrong direction. You and I can't deny that God's been good to the United States of America. I'm going to tell you this, you think about the food that we have and our shelter and our clothing. And, but way beyond that, we have churches and we have freedoms and we have liberties that others wish they had. And uh, he said, Pastor, he said, when I look at America, I see how good God's been to America. He said, but America is following down the same path. And he said, it won't be long until the churches are going to be vacated. As a matter of fact, we've seen it happen all around. And he said, things are going to, ministries are going to diminish and the lack of workers is going to be evident. And, the, and all that, he started talking and he said, it's amazing that America was uh, the number one nation to send out missionaries. And now there's other countries that are sending missionaries to America to evangelize America. But that's what we are. And anytime you turn away from God, there's going to be consequences. I read about this great happening, this great revival or awakening or whatever you want to call it tonight, but there's no doubt there was a change that took place. And then I take and I read over a few books of the Bible. If you turn over to the book of Nahum, if you'll just flip over just a couple of pages towards the New Testament, you'll run into the book of Nahum. And Nahum's considered to be one of the um, minor prophets. And by the way, the reason they're classified as minor prophets is not because of the message that's proclaimed, but it has to do uh, with the length of the book. But he's a minor prophet with a major message. And what's happened here is when God sent Jonah down to Nineveh and cried out, uh, yet in 40 days Nineveh shall be overthrown, Nineveh believed the word, they received the word, they turned, and God spared the city. But now 150 years has transpired and 150 years there had been some change, and things are not like it was back when Jonah went in and they started having revival. God raises up this prophet by the name of Nahum. And Nahum, he is a commissioned of God to go down to Nineveh, and he's to bring a message once again of judgment and condemnation. And when you look in verse number one, it says, The burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkshushite, uh, he says, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, great in power, and not at all quit, uh, uh, and will not at all quit the wicked. The Lord hath his way uh, in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds uh, are the dust of his feet. We read over in verse 6, who can stand before his indignation and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and rocks are thrown down by him. And we read about this message of judgment that Nahum, the name Nahum means comfort and consolation. And it's kind of strange uh, regarding the message that he's bringing, that of judgment and condemnation. But what's interesting here is even though he's talking about this burden in verse number one, the burden, the burden is speaking about that which is heavy. And it's the burden is he's bringing a message of doom and gloom and judgment and wrath. But in the midst of all that, I'm going to tell you tonight that God has always had a remnant. 
God's always had a group of people who have not abandoned him. They have not forsaken him. Uh, they've not turned back to their wicked ways, but wanted to uh, seek him and desire him. And uh, I, I realize tonight that we're part of a nation that's headed in the wrong direction. And we'd be absolutely naive and foolish tonight to think God would let things carry on like it is and not at some point bring about a chastening and rebuke and judgment uh, to the nation in regards to the sins that are being so uh, openly uh, displayed. I'm going to tell you, there's nothing anymore that causes anybody to blush or to frown. And it seems like uh, everything's all right. And, and sometimes I'm troubled because I see people who claim to be Christians and they say, well, I don't see anything wrong with that. And I think, well, that's the whole problem is you don't see anything wrong with that. But if you could see it through the words of God's pages or if you could see it through uh, the Holy Spirit's guidance, you'd realize that God said this is sin. And how in the world could you and I ever condone something that's sinful uh, when our Lord and Savior had to die for sin? Amen. And so there's this impending judgment, if you will. By the way, I see God pulling his hand back a little bit more and more and more. Amen. But the question tonight is what about God's people? What about those that haven't turned to wicked ways? What about those that have been true and faithful? Well, the Lord had a message in the midst of this message of judgment and wrath and darkness uh, that notice in verse number seven, this verse kind of shines like a light in the midst of the darkness. And right in the midst of this message that's brought by Nahum, uh, that the Lord put it in his heart to be sure that his people knew. In verse number seven, the word of God says, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. He knows who you are tonight. He knows where you are tonight. I say praise the Lord. He knoweth them that trust in him. Now we think about our nation tonight. And like the Assyrians were vile and wicked. Our nation. Uh, there's so many wicked and vile things going on. Uh, but there is a, a, a wonderful verse here. Reminding us that our Lord. Uh, that he's good. And he knoweth them that trust in him. Verse number two tells us that God uh, is jealous. And this word jealous is not in a negative sense. It's not like jealousy is what we know it, uh, nor like envy uh, or anything like that. But uh, the word of God tells us that we are his prized possession, that we are his workmanship, that we are his children. We are the sheep of his pasture. And really what it means tonight is that God, uh, that he cares about what belongs to him. And he wants to protect that which belongs to him. When you read verse number three, it tells us about uh, in the latter part that the Lord hath, uh, hath his ways uh, in the whirlwind, in the storm, the clouds uh, are the dust of his feet. Reminds us that the winds and the waves obey his voice, that he is still in control. And I say, thank God he's in control. But I said all that to get down to verse number seven, that I just got hung up on this verse when it says that he knoweth them that trust in him. That word knoweth is a very special and interesting word. It means that he knows intimately by experience. Not just he has a knowledge or knows about, but it means he knows us personally. If that ever sinks in, he does. And we'll talk about that here in a few minutes, but he knows us. I was looking at some verses where the Lord Jesus was speaking directly uh, in uh, the New Testament. And some of the things that he said, I thought, my goodness, how wonderful and how true and how special. And reminding them that he's not just a good teacher. He's not just a good man. He's not just a good prophet or priest that uh, he's not a, that he is the Lord God. He is almighty God, the great I am. And that he has a desire to want to fellowship and be with his people and speaks about relationships over and over and over again. And so many relationships, the bride, the groom, the uh, captain and the army. And, and uh, we re read about the vine and the branches and all these relationships speaks about uh, our duty and our delight and our development. But everything has to do with us abiding in him and him and us. But in John chapter number 10, the discourse on the good shepherd uh, he said in verse number three, to him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. 
and he calleth his own sheep by name. I wonder what Zacchaeus thought whenever he looked up and Zacchaeus trying to get a view of this man that's come by that's done so much in the lives of others and he's a wee little man and climbed up there just to get a view and Jesus stops and says, Zacchaeus, come down. How did he know my name? I think about that song, Chloe, saying he knows my name. My goodness, he knows my name. There's a lot of Todd's out there but he knows who this Todd is. Matter of fact, I looked up, and there's some Todd Heralds out there. There's one who's a, a famous uh, doctor and important. And uh, I haven't ever got uh, crossed up with him. But, uh, uh, but what I'm saying tonight is the Lord knows us by name. He knows us intimately. And the Word of God tells us, And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them. I'm reminded tonight that you don't, Drive sheep, but you lead sheep. And David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He talked about the Lord leading him by the still waters and leading him to the green pastures. And, and uh, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. And, and talks about the Lord goeth before them and uh, his sheep. And, they, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Not only do, uh, does he know us, but thank God he gives us the privilege to know him and to know his voice. Uh, we read on down in, in uh, verse number 27. The word of God says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them. and They follow me. But he didn't stop there. He said, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. And, and then he goes on further, and he says, And neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I say, What a wonderful relationship that we have with him. Whenever you read about the good shepherd in verse number 14 of John 10, he said, And I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Uh, we read down verse 17, Therefore doth my Father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. And we read of these verses, and, and then over in John chapter number uh, 15, the Lord, uh, that he makes another wonderful announcement here that I'm sure uh, didn't really register in the hearts of those that was hearing it, uh, like tonight, that we have a hard time grasping hold of this wonderful uh, reality. But uh, in John chapter number 5, and in, or excuse me, John chapter 15, verse number 13, listen to what Jesus said. He said, greater love hath... No man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now, wait a minute. Back in John chapter number 10, it talked about laying down his life for the sheep. That he's the, the good shepherd that would lay down his life for the sheep. But now it's took another level. And now he's speaking about him laying down his life for his friends. Then when we read down in verse number 14, ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Now that word friend, when you look it up in the Greek context, what it means is it means an associate. Now let that sink in tonight that the creator of the universe would want to identify and associate with us. It's one thing for him to say we're his sheep. That's wonderful. But it's another thing for him to say that we're his friends. We're his friends. I was looking in the book of Jeremiah right before the service tonight, and I was reading. Jeremiah's situation was much like what was going on in Nahum. There was judgment that was coming. As a matter of fact, the children of Israel is going to be taken into uh, Babylonian captivity because of their sin. Uh, but uh, in uh, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, uh, that the Lord, uh, he had sent a message and said, For thus saith the Lord, verse number 10 of Jeremiah 29, for thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. Verse 11, he said, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me, and you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and you shall seek me and find me when you, search, uh, when you shall search for me with all your heart. Now, what's amazing is when you think about the population of the world, I don't know the exact population, not sure if anybody does other than the Lord himself, 
but it's some 7 billion people. Now, to try to get our minds around that number, if you were to take people and put them shoulder to shoulder and line them up on the equator, it said that there's enough population to make a, a lap around the world and then some left over. Now, when I think about that, I say, that makes me feel insignificant. That makes me feel real small. Makes me feel real little. You ever take your uh, internet and you go to uh, maybe Google Earth and uh, you're way up here and you're looking down and you're seeing the world and, uh, or maybe the country or whatever to see the planet and then you can zoom in on a, a particular area and it looks, you know, so small. But then you zoom on in and when you zoom on and you start getting down and you get down to where I'm talking about one little area, just the neighborhood you live in and think about all the people that's right there in that area and you start zooming out and zooming out and zooming out and before you know it, you're overwhelmed and you're thinking to yourself, how in the world would God in heaven be able to know anything about me when there's so many people out here to know about? And there's people being born and people dying and there's all kind of needs and, and there's people in other countries and all these prayers being offered up. And you would think that he would be so busy tending to the business of uh, running the universe that he'd certainly not have any time for somebody like me or you. But I'm glad, thank God tonight, that's not the case. Amen. I say praise the Lord that he knows us. Uh, we, we read about that he knows us individually. He said, I know the thoughts that I think uh, towards you. Towards you individually. Uh, I remember back some time ago, I was preaching in the, out of Philippians chapter 4, verse number 8. And he said, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are, and he goes to the list of honest and just and good report. And he gives us all these things. He said, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, he said, think on these things. He said that our minds and what they focus and what they think on has a big part of what goes on within us. And we've got to think on the right things. Don't be hung up on all this negative stuff and, and all the naysayers and all the negative news, but focus on him and his word and his promises. Uh, but I preach the message uh, and the title of the message is what's on your mind. Sometimes I don't even know how to sort out what all's on my mind. You know what I'm talking about? All this stuff running around. But what's amazing is God knows what's on our mind and he's given us an opportunity here to know what's on his mind and what's on his mind is you and me. The thoughts that I think toward you. These thoughts are intimate. He knows every time our heart beats. Some of you got them Fitbits and all this stuff and you're trying to, I got so many steps in today. Say, so you know what? I was noticing this thing that I, when I was riding my bicycle, it wasn't counting and when I was going... And it's close, but it's not accurate. Can I tell you this? God knows every single step you took. Matter of fact, he knows the number of hair that's on your head. He knows every time your eye blinks. Isn't that amazing? That he knows us like that. Over in Psalm 139, let me just read a few verses and I'll try to hurry right along. Uh, Psalm 139, David, he's, uh, he's got a hold of some of these truths. And David said in verse number 1 of Psalm 139, he said, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. That's what David has come to realize. He said in verse number four, for there's not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou hast been, or thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. And he said, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain to it. David said, Lord, you know everything about me. You know my thoughts, you know the words in my mouth. He said that uh, you lay your hand upon me and he said the knowledge of this is too wonderful for me. He said I cannot, he said I really what he's saying is I can't comprehend it. I can't comprehend it tonight either, but thank God uh, that it's still true. Uh, his knowledge of us is individual, it's intimate, and thank God it's infinite. He knows all things that, uh, that David, he said in verse number 14, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And, my, and that my soul knoweth right well. And David speaks about all these things. He said, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count, uh, should count them, they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with thee. 
And David speaks about all these things. And I say, praise the Lord tonight. He knows us instantly. His eyes are constantly upon us. He knows every time a sparrow falls. And don't you know he knows about us? He knows about our sin. He knows about our situation. He knows about our sicknesses. He knows about our sorrow. And when we come to him and pray, we don't, we're not informing him of anything he doesn't already know. But we're uh, making uh, uh, the knowledge that we are aware that this thing is beyond our ability to change. And we're asking God to take control. But let me finish up by this. Going back to Nahum, said, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. But he, Nahum said, The Lord is good. He's good. Sometimes we ask each other, said, well, How are you? I'm good. Really what we should be saying is I'm doing good. But really we, we're not accurate in saying I'm good. Because the Bible says there's none that doeth good, no, not one. And I go further and say there's none good, no, not one. But thank God that's, there is one that is good. Uh, you remember back in the book of Mark uh, that uh, the Lord Jesus had an encounter with this rich young ruler. And the rich young ruler comes running up in Mark chapter number 10, verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him and asking him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit internal, internal, eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, and that is God. He said, Do you really believe that I am he? If not, why are you calling me good? But Nahum, he said this, he said, The Lord is good. Is good. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying regardless of judgment that it might be coming, he's still good. Regardless if the finances are up or if they're down, he's still good. Regardless of who's in government or who's in the, uh, the, uh, the uh, whatever, the White House, the Lord's still good. Regardless if we're having pain and troubles, he's still good. Regardless of our problems, the Lord is still good. The psalmist said in 145 verse 9, The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are all or over all his works. Psalm 34, verse number 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Nahum said the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. The word stronghold means a place of safety, means a refuge, it means a place of protection, a safe harbor in the storm. And I want to say thank God tonight that we have somebody to go to in our time of trouble. I was thinking Job said, man that's born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. That trouble is a part of our life. A psalm uh, in the 27, verse number 4, uh, the psalmist speaks about this. The psalmist said, one thing I have desired of the Lord that I will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord in the, all the days of my life. And behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. He said, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. I say, thank God tonight he, that we're safe in the refuge, the refuge Jesus Christ. Uh, in Psalm 46, verse number one, uh, that the word of God speaks about this. God is our refuge and strength, very present help in trouble. And Psalm 50, the same truth reiterated again in Psalm 50 and verse number 15. And call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. When I read these verses tonight, I say in the midst of impending judgment that the Lord is good. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. One preacher said, if God carried a wallet, that he'd have a picture of me and you in it. Yeah. You know, that, that sounds kind of silly. But in reality, that God's not ashamed of us. Yeah, and we shouldn't ever be ashamed of him. Yeah, we may deny him sometimes by our words or actions, but yet he'll never deny us. He says, and thou art mine. Nobody's going to pluck you out of my hand. When things come in the time of trouble, he says, you're going to be all right. 
you're going to be all right. He said, I'm going to take care of you because you've got a stronghold in the time of trouble. I say praise his holy name. We're going to stop here tonight, take some prayer requests. I do have a couple of things I want to share with you. First of all, if you have.